everybody for coming today. Um, so this talk is going to be a little bit different than some of the other talks that we have had at these Friday afternoon lectures because I'm not sharing research results. I'm really explaining the approach that I take to my research in the first place. Um, and so why am I giving this talk in the first place? Um, my time here at the garden so far and the like almost a year um, I've been here has been it's been a really wonderful chance for me to learn from a lot of you about a much more technical side of botany than what I was trained in um, as an anthropologist. Um, I mean, anthropologists, even anthropologists who deal with plants, um, don't really have much reason to learn about taxonomy or genetics or the way a herbarium works. So it occurred to me that if so much of what you all do every day and take for granted is new to me, then it might also be the other way around. Um, you might not know the kinds of questions that I am interested in asking as an anthropologist, um, what it looks and sounds like when I'm in the field actually doing research, um, you know, or uh, you know, how I approach thinking about research questions. So my goal here is to hopefully explain and make it a little bit clearer what my work actually entails, um, you know, what, how an anthropologist approaches plants and conservation, um, and hopefully open the door to some future collaboration by showing you what I, as a social scientist, can offer. Um, and also, it is an excuse for me to put in pretty pictures of plants that I took in the field that didn't necessarily fit into, uh, you know, uh, presentations that connect more closely to my dissertation work. Um, so this talk's going to take, you know, three, three broad sections. So first, I'm going to do what is anthropology? And my apologies if this comes across as a little bit elementary. I am taking bits and pieces of it from my you know, first day lecture for intro to cultural anthropology classes. But I just thought it would be good to explain just sort of a little bit of background about what this field even is. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the methods that I use. So what does it actually look like when somebody like me is going to do research? What, how do we approach the kinds of questions that we're asking? Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about how do anthropologists think about conservation, which is something that we're all concerned about, um, both how to accomplish conservation projects effectively, but also sort of how to think about them, you know, ethically and equitably. Um, so we'll start talking about what anthropology actually is. Um, and again, bear with me, this is review for many of you. But when I talk to people in everyday life, um, saying that I'm a cultural anthropologist. And it could be when I'm like chatting with the person sitting next to me on an airplane or just striking up a conversation with somebody random at a bar or something like that. And sometimes I'll get funny responses when I say I'm an anthropologist. Um, you know, oh, you know, do you study dinosaurs? Nope, study people. Uh, oh, are you like the person on that TV show Bones? Um, wrong kind of anthropologist. Um, or, you know, what do you think about ancient aliens? Um, please, God, no. <laughs> but uh, jokes aside, um, some of this confusion does have sort of a legitimate basis. It doesn't come totally out of the blue. Um, and I'll explain why in a sec. Um, you know, so the first past few times I've taught intro to cultural anthropology at Wash U's University College, um, I started out with this slide. Um, and so anthropology is the study of humankind and humankind in a lot of different ways. So, you know, our biological evolution, um, you know, other other um, primate species that are related to humans, uh, what humans have done in the past, what humans are doing now. Um, and so, you know, this, the Greek anthro anthropos, man or human, suffix logia, science or study of. But that covers a whole lot of territory. Um, and also before we get into a little bit more discussion of what anthropology is, I also want to touch on the fact that there's a very problematic history associated with anthropology that is something that the field is actively grappling with. Um, so one thing that we have to contend with is its role in the history of colonialism and imperialism. Um, so on the one hand, colonialism facilitated anthropological fieldwork. A place that has been, you know, conquered by a colonial power might make it easy for somebody who has been trained in the colonial metropolis to, um, you know, get there. There's more convenient transportation options. Uh, you know, white researchers might have felt physically safer if there was a colonial presence nearby. There's more funding available to study the indigenous people in a colonized territory. 
Um, and uh, one of the results of this is that anthropology has um, started to occupy what has sometimes been called the uh, quote unquote savage slot in academia in that anthropology is the discipline that studies the you know quote unquote this is obviously a problematic and derogatory term savage other um, leaving other disciplines within the social sciences to study the quote unquote civilized people and I'm you know these are not categories that we should you know just take at face value there's something that's absolutely worth problematizing but nevertheless. Um, so this is something that anthropologists today actively grapple with, something that's regularly discussed in anthropology classes, graduate seminars, publications and stuff. And um, you know, some of us are working to actively try to decolonize the discipline by you know, reading and writing more non-white scholars, working closely with local communities to develop projects that they want, uh, publicizing research results in the languages that the people that we're working with are actually able to read and things like that. Um, and so not to start off this, this, this talk on, you know, perhaps a, a negative foot, but this is still an incredibly important topic that is very much under discussion. And it would have, uh, I would have been missing something if I hadn't, if I hadn't mentioned this. But um, so going back to this idea of there being confusion about what anthropology actually is. Um, so in the US, it's divided into four subfields. Um, and so not all countries consider all of these parts of anthropology to be anthropology. So sometimes archaeologists, for, in, for instance, will get really mad when you say that they're, what they're doing is anthropology if they were trained in Europe. Um, because in Europe, archaeologists are often considered to be more connected to like art history and like studies of like, you know, the, like classical antiquity. Um, but in any case, so these four subfields are archaeology, so studying people in the past based on the material uh, culture that they have left behind. Um, there's biological anthropology, which is concerned with the evolution and physiology of humans. So they're the ones who are going out there and studying bones and fossils. Um, and they also study our closest primate relatives. So if some of you were at that Living Earth Collaborative event a few weeks ago where there was a team from Wash U that was explaining their lemur research in Madagascar, those are biological anthropologists. So even though their degrees are in anthropology, um, what they do is way closer to what somebody from like an evolutionary biology department would do to anything that I do. Um, then there is linguistic anthropology and they study language and like how language and social life affect one another. And they do a lot of really cool work in like, uh, you know, um, doing things like preserving, you know, helping preserve languages at risk of dying out, a bunch of other cool stuff. Um, and then there's what I do, which is cultural anthropology. So we study people that are alive today, mainly by talking to them. Um, and so we're interested in uncovering like the whys and the hows that underlie human behaviors and choices. Um, and so humans all over the world have an incredible diversity of beliefs and behaviors, and we want to understand why that is and how it works. Um, and so the tool that we use is ethnography, the systematic study of people's societies and cultures. And so our studies are observational. Um, we're not conducting experiments the way, you know, other natural or even some social scientists might. Um, so it's extremely common for anthropologists to come up with some kind of hypothesis for explaining why X, Y, Z cultural phenomenon is happening and then completely toss the whole thing out of the window when you get to the field and you realize that something else you hadn't even thought of is much more interesting and relevant. Um, but even though we're not conducting repeatable experiments or testing scientific hypotheses, it's still a systematic kind of study. We're not collecting data arbitrarily or randomly. Um, we're using specific methods to collect data to answer certain kinds of questions. Um, it's also good to know the word ethnography can refer to both the method and the product of that method. So you can talk about like, I just read a great ethnography of artisan rug weavers in Morocco, or you can say like, I'm doing ethnography. 
Um, so here are some examples of the kinds of questions an anthropologist might be interested in asking. And these are all referencing actual scholarly projects in anthropology that are within the past couple of decades, at least, so they're relatively recent. Um, and this is far from comprehensive, um, but I just wanted to give you a sense of questions that we find interesting. Um, so what are the unintended consequences of a US development program on a South, poor South African country or community? Um, what can items that have been discarded by migrants um, across the US-Mexico border tell us about the experience of border crossing? Um, what are the uh, you know, social barriers preventing HIV positive people from receiving adequate health care in Haiti? Um, how are Australian environmentalists dealing with the ethical dilemma of um, killing invasive foxes in order to save native endangered penguins? And how are Indian tea plantation workers impacted by fair trade policies? Um, what common anxieties about modern American life are shared by people who claim to have been abducted by UFOs? So this is like an incredibly diverse range of questions, but they all get at something in society that's working in some kind of a way and trying to figure out what, what is the explanation for it? How do people see it themselves? How might an outsider see it? Um, and there's a lot of overlap between cultural anthropology and the different social sciences, um, especially human geography, um, sociology, and sometimes political science. Um, a lot of these differences are historical artifacts of how these different disciplines uh, you know, developed. And they've since kind of converged. I mean, I read a lot of stuff in geography, um, also sociology, especially. Um, but like I said before, historically, anthropology was about mainly studying non-Western cultures almost exclusively. Though, of course, nowadays, anthropologists study societies all over the world, um, even urban and Western societies. Um, anthropology also has an emphasis on long-term qualitative fieldwork in a way that other fields don't necessarily. So a sociolo sometimes sociologists will do qualitative fieldwork and you know, produce ethnographies, but they're also much more likely than an anthropologist to look at a large data set of survey data or census data or something and you know, derive a, a project out of that. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, human geography is sort of focused on the role of space and place, the geographic element. But the geographic element integrates very well with the social element. So we do often talk about a lot of the same stuff, especially in environmental, environmental concerns. Um, so now I'm going to talk about what goes on when we're actually doing research. Um, so this picture looks like I'm having fun here, which I am. Um, I'm the one in the pink shirt, but uh, I'm doing research through what we call participant observation. Um, the folks that I'm with in the photo are from a group based in Asheville, North Carolina called Kudzu Culture. And they experiment with different ways of using kudzu um, that, in the hopes that one of them might end up being commercially viable enough to put a dent in the kudzu population in the South. Uh, their tagline is eating the vine that ate the South. Um, and so we're, looks like those like long streamers look kind of like seaweed or something. We're actually in a river processing the kudzu vines for fiber, which they're then going to use on a loom um, to weave cloth. Um, and so I put together a somewhat idealized process of how cultural anthropologists or me might do research. Um, so it's roughly divided into the before the field, in the field, after the field. We place a lot of importance on the field. It's this sort of almost sometimes in like a quasi-mystical way. It's this very transformative experience because it's an experience. It can sometimes be quite an overwhelming experience. Um, so the research process goes something like this, where you choose a site or a region to focus on. Then you choose some kind of a key problem or question to study. You learn the language, which is really important. That is something that is not always done in other social science fields. There's a lot more emphasis on learning the language in anthropology. Um, and then you get to the field. Um, you have to 
build, it's a lot of emphasis on building relationships. You need to earn the trust of the people that you're working with. So you're building rapport and you're developing these relationships so that people will tell you what you want to know. Then you do your interviews, you do your participant observation, you take your notes, and then you probably have to rethink your research questions because you learned something that you never would have thought of before you um, even got there. And then once you get back, you're doing the, you know, the boring part, which is transcribing your interviews, and then you write things up, and then you return to the field to follow up as necessary. Um, so in practice, this is not linear. It's an iterative process. It's inherently open-ended because you never know exactly what you're going to find. Your initial research questions might be built on assumptions that don't make any sense at all when you are actually on the ground and start talking to people. Um, so there's a lot of going back and forth between these steps as you continually refine your research process. And so most of my research is done by interviews. Um, like most other anthropologists, what I do are semi-structured interviews. So I, I basically have a general list of topics that I want to cover in an interview, but I'm not necessarily asking them in the same order or using the same wording. Um, and so the point of this is to make an interview seem much more like a natural conversation with somebody. Um, and it allows you to follow up on interesting lines of thinking, probe people as much as seems you know, effective. Um, and this is compared to something like a very structured interview where you're basically, it's almost like a questionnaire that is happening orally where you're asking the exact same questions in the exact same order. Um, so that is not what I do. Um, most of my interviews are one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes I'll interview a couple or a small group. Um, some anthropologists will even do things like focus groups or, inter you know, interviewing like eight people at once. Um, that's not something that I do in my practice, but uh, I suppose it's a first time for everything if it ends up being useful. Um, and I usually try to do my interviews at people's homes or workplaces um, if that is something that people are comfortable with. Um, and so when I was doing my research on ginseng, um, sit down interviews were usually in people's homes and then I would go out into the woods. Um, you know, or look at, you know, go through people's personal gardens to look at plants, which was really good, a really good supplement to the recorded interviews. Uh, I didn't really have any good interview pictures, but this is from, a, after, when COVID happened, I did a lot of interviews on Zoom, but this is actually from a, uh, a moderated discussion that the Smithsonian hosted um, with uh, ginseng diggers as part of their Folklife Festival a couple years ago. Um, and then in some ways, participant observation is kind of the bread and butter of the anthropologist's toolkit. It kind of is what makes us, I guess, unique as a field. Uh, the anthropologist Clifford Geertz, in a sort of tongue-in-cheek way, described participant observation as deep hanging out, which is actually a pretty good dis like, description of what it actually is. In a nutshell, you're, you're living and you're working alongside the people that you're studying in order to get intimate firsthand knowledge about what their lives are actually like. So an anthropologist interested in the impacts of climate change on fishermen might like get a job on a fishing vessel for a few months. Um, many medical anthropologists get jobs or volunteer positions in hospitals or clinical settings. Um, I, for me, for my research, I had an internship on a wild simulated ginseng farm um, in North Carolina for a while, and I would go out ginseng hunting in the woods with my interlocutors. So that's a picture of me learning how to dig ginseng in far southwestern Virginia. And so this gives you ideas for questions to ask in actual interviews that you might never have thought of otherwise. And it also lets you verify what people are telling you in interviews. Um, which isn't to say that people are always lying to you in interviews, although that certainly does happen from time to time. But sometimes people just don't know how to answer your questions. Maybe they've never thought about something that they take for granted in their life in explicit terms. So if you ask them something, even if it's something they do every day, they might not know how to respond. And so this participant observation can kind of be a way to get around that. You can learn like a lot from the gaps between what people tell you in interviews and then what you observe when you're actually working alongside people. And then one of the questions that people often ask me is um, how do you get people to actually talk to you? Um, for my research, the people I was working with, the ginseng harvesters, are a notoriously secretive bunch. 
Um, nobody wants to tell you where their ginseng patch is. Um, but I got to interview several dozen ginseng diggers, got several of them to show me their secret patches, uh, even got people to talk to me quite candidly about poaching and trespassing and other illegal activities. Um, and so how did I do it? Um, partly just showing up to stuff when I'm trying to gain access to a new community, go to as many publicly accessible events as possible. Um, so this for the ginseng, it would have included ginseng auctions, farmers markets, uh, workshops, Q&A sessions with, regu regu uh, with regulators, a bunch of things like that. Um, and then you can just kind of strike up conversations with people and then that can build into a relationship moving forward. I'd also reach out directly to people with a public presence who are involved in the community that I'm interested in. So like local small scale ginseng dealers have to be registered with the state. So their phone numbers are publicly accessible. So I just cold called a few and then some that didn't always pan out, but sometimes it did. Um, and then weirdly, social media is a great way to get access to people. I'm always astounded by how many people respond when I post something in like a forum on Facebook, just being like, hey, I'm a researcher, who wants to talk to me? People actually do respond and they really do wanna to talk to you, which is sometimes like, who knew? <laughs> I probably wouldn't have if I were in their shoes, but uh, I'm gonna take advantage of it if people are willing. Um, but then once you build these initial relationships, then you can do what we call the snowball method, which is basically a fancy word for like, or not fancy, um, a you know sort of a cheerful sounding word for basically relying on people's social networks to find you new, new contacts. So you interview somebody, they realize that you're not insane, you're not a government representative out to get them, you're not going to you know murder them in their sleep or whatever. And then they can say, oh, I've got, I know so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so, let me put you in touch with them. And that and it really builds from there. Um, and then of course, there's the ethical guidelines that we're expected to follow doing research. Um, the American Anthropological Association, we call it the AAA, not to be confused with the guys who call for roadside assistance um, on a long car trip. Um, that's our main professional organization. Uh, we have a code of ethics, gets regular updates, um, but the one that we really try to follow, the one most absolutely important thing that we focus on is this idea of doing no harm to our communities or our informants. And that can have an expansive definition. Um, so doing no harm can involve, you know, common practices, stuff that almost all anthropologists do, like referring to places or people in our manuscripts using pseudonyms. Um, or even doing things like making, like creating composites from multiple individuals in our writing in order to obscure any potentially identifying information. Um, you know, it can also involve things like providing a gift or compensation to the people who are participating in our research. Could even do things like advocating for a community's interests doing activism. Um, and it can also mean things like being careful about how we talk about our community, the communities that we work with in our uh, you know, publications, um, especially communities that have a history of marginalization or oppression. So you don't want to basically use your research to reinforce harmful stereotypes about communities, especially when it's things like, you know, indigenous communities that maybe have a reputation for being violent or warlike. You want to be careful about if your if your you know study touches on interpersonal violence, that it doesn't necessarily reinforce some of those narratives about, you know, quote unquote, the savage. Um, there's also legal regulations, of course, that pertain to this. And this is something that I've been working on for the past couple of weeks for my new project on Ozark ethnobotany, because um, people who are studying human subjects need to get approval from an institutional review board. Um, this was all put in place in the 70s in response to stuff like the Tuskegee syphilis study, just really awfully, horribly unethical research. Um, so most of this definitely applies more to people doing biomedical research. So, you know, if you're doing like a clinical study on a vaccine or something. Um, but if you're doing any human subjects based research, even stuff that's just interviews, I still have to comply by these rules. Um, so basically it involves writing up your research, asking a separate board to say, is this okay or is this not? And then 
um, they will approve it or not. So since Mobot does not have an internal IRB, my understanding is that perhaps it did at some point in the past, but no longer does. Um, and I'm not collaborating with somebody at a local university and can hop on theirs for my Ozark project. I had to go to an external, an external one, um, pay them a bunch of money. And they told me that, yes, your research is benign and you're not gonna harm anybody, so you can do it. And all of the journals that want you to have IRB approval for your research in order to publish your stuff will be satisfied. Um, and then I just wanna talk about the idea of bias um, for most, since most of you are trained in the natural sciences. Uh, the question of bias and then related questions like sampling method and statistical you know, validity, uh, they can be kind of troubling in an observational social science like anthropology. Um, I think there's a tendency in general in American society to, to highly value um, you know, so-called objective knowledge, uh, the implication that objective knowledge is totally logical and fact-based and therefore superior to you know, anything that's subjective and clouded by biases and emotions. Um, and most cultural anthropologists don't necessarily use the scientific method leading to accusations that anthropology isn't objective. Um, and so by this, I mean, anthropologists are not using deductive reasoning by developing a hypothesis, designing an experiment with intervention groups and controlled groups to test the hypothesis, and then you know, statistically, quantitatively analyzing the results. Instead, we're using inductive reasoning. We're making lots of observations about the world and then developing theories that would explain why these observations could be true. Um, but if anthropology as a way of understanding the world you know, rests on the quality of our observations, that leaves a lot of room for non-objectivity. After all, fieldwork is like this intensely personal experience. We all bring our personal biases and assumptions into the field. And then there's a lot of stuff that happens just because you have a personality that people in the field find appealing, or you just randomly meet somebody by chance who happens to be a great informant. Um, or you know you reminded somebody who you talked to of their granddaughter and they decide to tell you way more information than they otherwise might have. Um, simply being present in your field site influences things, but you can learn a lot about the way people think by how people respond to your presence or your questions. Um, it's a collaborative process and it's okay that it's not necessarily objective um, and it's not really trying to be. Uh, it's, I think the way I think a lot of us think about it is that it's more important to be transparent about our biases, to question and, and seriously interrogate our biases um, and to ask what kinds of biases or influences that we bring or other researchers bring that impact you know, um, their work. So basically not trying to eliminate it, but we're trying to acknowledge it and think critically about the way that it impacts what we do and, and the kind of conclusions that we draw. So now I'm gonna spend a bit of time um, talking about how anthropologists might think about conservation. And so we're interested in how different cultures explore the, or think about and understand the human role in the natural or non-human or more than human world. Um, and then many anthropologists are also interested in applying some of these insights towards developing better strategies for preventing environmental damage and helping communities that are disproportionately impacted by problems like deforestation and climate change. Um, and so this picture is actually from some of my early stage research in West Virginia. A guy in the photo is a anti-mountaintop removal coal mine site, uh, coal activist, and that's an old mining site that um, used to be a coal mine. They restored it by just checking a bunch of non-native grass seed on top and um, see that all over Appalachia. Um, so a common saying in anthropology is that our job is to make the strange familiar and the familiar strange. And so what does this mean for environment and conservation issues? Um, and so if we're making the strange familiar, we're taking our interlocutor's beliefs about nature and the environment seriously, even if we don't necessarily agree with them or the premises they're built on. The point is to figure out uh, what we call the emic perspective on nature, the way that people within a culture understand things. 
So that might mean kind of like bracketing and setting aside our own scientific understanding of, you know, physics and chemistry and biology and taking seriously the internal logic of how somebody from another culture understands things. Um, and, you know, sometimes that means at least temporarily in your own mind, trying to understand the internal logic behind something that, uh, you know, taking seriously something that you may otherwise dismiss as like folk belief or superstition. Um, and so if the goal is conservation, figuring out the things that people, the people that we're working with think are important and what they understand to be the biggest barriers to getting what they want. And then figuring out what they want in the first place, you know, could be, it could be protecting tradition, could be maintaining a sacred landscape, could be just protecting the ability to make their own decisions or getting enough to eat. Um, you know, that's something that we can't take for granted and come in assuming that we know. Um, and then to do this properly, we need to make familiar things seem strange. So to recognize, you know, our own assumptions about the world and ask, like, what if the things that we take for granted every day actually work in an entirely different way? Um, so it's the, the ability to imagine the world is otherwise from the way we understand it to be. Um, as a side note, that's... I think that this part of it is actually why I'm a big fantasy and science fiction fan, and I think I'm probably not alone in amongst anthropologists for that. And I think part of it is because it's this ability, it trains you to not take for granted a lot of the things that, you know, you maybe you otherwise would about life. Imagine, imagine the world if it would be different. Um, so we can talk a little bit about what some of these common assumptions actually are. Um, I'm constructing a little bit of a straw man here because some of these ideas aren't universally held amongst American environmentalists. There's been a lot of critique and new thinking um, that kind of, you know, tries to go beyond some of these ideas. Um, you know, sort of like some, I think some uh, environmental humanities people just sort of like this is this is conversation has been had and done and why are we still talking about this, uh, which was something that a reviewer on a recent paper of mine brought up. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, um, I'm still continually finding people, you know, volunteers, donors, um, you know, scientists and people who work for conservation organizations sometimes who still, you know, sort of take for granted some of these concepts. Um, so these are some of the ones that I just think about the most. Um, the idea of nature and culture as two entirely separate domains. Um, the idea of humans being inherently harmful to nature, but then at the same time, this like sort of also this assumption that there's some human uses of nature that are less harmful to others. There's maybe some elements of like class and, and racism that get bound up with that. Um, you know, recreation being better than, um, you know, subsistence use of forests, for instance. And then the idea of properly restoring a landscape means making it sort of turning back the clock, looking historically, and that it's always best to, you know, to make it look like it did at some point in the past. And that some point in the past is usually identified as being before the arrival of Europeans, um, which isn't to say that that's necessarily always wrong, but that's not necessarily the way that should be, you know, just sort of like taken for granted without further discussion. Um, so here's an example of how anthropologists can show how humans engage with nature in ways that challenge some of those common assumptions. Um, this comes from a book called Misreading the African Landscape by James Fairhead and Melissa Leach, who are two British anthropologists. Um, and I'm sharing this because I encountered this book very early in my anthropology education, and it kind of blew my mind about the power of anthropology as a tool. Um, as well as the degree with the degree to which some initial assumptions can be totally wrong. Um, and so this, this um, research took place in rural Guinea um, in the uh, forest savanna matrix they have there. So it's this wide open grassland dotted with villages, villages ringed with a small dense forested area. Uh, and colonial administrators assumed that the entire landscape was once forested and has been since then, quote unquote, degraded due to the, uh, you know, uh, harmful practices of the people who were living in this landscape. Um, and so different aid organizations and government groups and stuff were all trying to like, let's restore the forest, let's restore the forest. Um, none of them were particularly successful. Um, so basically what was happening was, um, you know, 
colonial governments and then post-colonial aid organizations from Europe and the U.S. were blaming the locals for not taking care of their landscape properly. Well, what Fairhead and Liege did, so they worked with villagers. Um, they also looked at aerial photographs over time, um, oral histories, and archival data, and they found that something totally different was going on. Um, and so this was actually originally a forest. It was not, I mean, it was originally a grassland. It was not originally a forest. And the forest rings were actively planted and tended by the people who lived there so they could have nearby timber and fruit and other useful resources. Um, so it wasn't like they were degrading the landscape, they were adding the forests. Um, and so they're increasing biodiversity. Um, and so that suggests a shift in thinking needed for conservation projects in this region. So instead of trying to recreate this landscape-wide forest that never actually existed in the first place, you know, how can, how can aid organizations support conservation in a way that's consistent with local lifestyles? Maybe it also requires thinking about, con about conservation or restoration that's not necessarily rooted in the past, but with the landscape that we have now and the lifestyles of people that we have now, what is a way to create a functional biodiverse ecosystem that works for everybody moving forward, even if it doesn't necessarily look like some kind of historical state? Um, my own research with ginseng diggers in Appalachia, um, that also addresses this idea that you know, people, local people who make a living from local natural resources are environmentally destructive and don't care about, you know, the land where they live. Um, so in this case, it gets caught up in a lot of negative stereotypes that urban people in the U.S. have about poor rural Appalachians, um, tend to portray them as, you know, uneducated hillbillies, um, at best sort of comically ignorant. Um, and at worst, sort of dangerous and destructive. Um, and so American ginseng, the plant that I work with, slow growing perennial, when it's harvested from the wild, it can sell for $1,000 a pound or more. Um, but wild populations are in decline. And the common reason that people give is that, you know, people are just harvesting everything and they don't care and they're just not leaving anything for future generations. So as a result, there have been very stringent regulations that have been implemented in order to restrict harvest. Um, but there's a significant amount of illegal harvesting that's still happening. Um, the story that I found is a lot more complicated. Um, archival research indicated that people have been worried about overharvesting ginseng since the 1800s, but they haven't managed to drive it to extinction yet. Um, and I credit that to an active culture of stewardship of ginseng. And that includes practices like planting seeds and transplanting plants to places where they can be more easily cared and watched and, and you know watched over. And people aren't perfect. There's still a lot of unsustainable harvesting going on, but there's also a lot of potential for landowners and forest service staff and conservation organizations and whatnot to amplify and promote existing culturally relevant conservation practices and narratives that people are already familiar with. Um, and then there's also the insistence that ginseng populations are declining solely because of irresponsible responsible harvesting that kind of like directs blame away from other things that are seriously impacting the landscape, like uh, mining and, you know, recreational development and climate change and even white-tailed deer overpopulation. Um, and so we've talked about the ways that anthropology can help with conservation when it comes to figuring out the causes of environmental damage and how our assumptions are often challenged once we look at, once we sort of start talking to people and looking at what's really going on. But, um, you know, so say that we've correctly identified an environmental threat and we figured out several concrete methods that people in a local community uh, you know, what they can do in order to mitigate it. Um, maybe there's a common farming practice that poses a threat to a uh, endangered orchid species in a, in a nearby forest. Um, and we want to encourage people to use a slightly different farming method. Um, you know, you can go in with tons of information. You can go in with PowerPoints and videos and take people on walks and you name it. Um, you know, you can, you know, you can convince people, yes, this is an important thing to worry about, but nothing changes. People know that they should change, um, but they don't. 
and it's really frustrating. And people who are, you know, do environmental, you know, run environmental programs are like, what, what's going on? This happens all the time. Um, and you see this, I mean, and you see this with other stuff too, not just environmental things. Um, I mean, I know for a fact that I should probably work out more than I do and maybe uh, drink less beer and eat fewer, eat less cake. <laughs> but what do I do? I, you know, sometimes I know that I should go work out, but I don't. Um, and I'm sure that this is a common experience for many of us here because that's what modern life is. You know that you should do a thing and you don't do it anyway. Um, and so this idea that people don't necessarily change their behavior in response to additional information is actually quite well studied in anthropology and other social sciences. Um, despite what some classical economists might think, um, people don't always behave according to what you might expect from a rational, utility maximizing, you know, individual perspective. Um, for one thing, people are often really risk averse and reluctant to change something that they do in their lives that's good enough. Even if, even if you know that another way of doing things might be, you know, better, you know, you're not, you're not gonna, you're not gonna fix what ain't broke as far as you're concerned. Um, especially if you're somebody like a poor farmer, uh, you're not gonna wanna exchange the certainty of something that you know works or know works most of the time for a method that maybe might be better, but you don't know, it could be a total disaster. Um, so behavior change is actually a social process. Um, you might be reluctant to be the first person to you know, use a new method of managing your grazing land or install solar panels. Um, but if there's somebody else in your village or your community who you know, makes that first change and you know, there's always going to be the rare early adopters who are really excited to be, the, you know, maybe or less risk averse than average and are kind of excited to do the new thing. Um, and then nothing bad happens, then you're much more willing to entertain the possibility of making a change yourself. Um, so way back in the day, um, God, this was probably like 15 years ago at this point, I was working on a project um, in when I, I was working in energy policy in Washington, D.C. And I did a project where we interviewed farmers across the South about energy efficiency. Um, and we were like, what's preventing you from making these investments in energy efficiency? And most of the time, people wanted to just stick with what they knew, um, unless a respected community member who we would refer to as a trusted partner in our research made the changes first. Um, and so that offers some insight um, into how you might get people to make changes. You target the trusted partners in the community um, and anthropologists can play a really important role in figuring out who those trusted partners are. Um, and that can be at least one approach out of many towards using the knowledge gleaned from anthropology in order to make positive changes. Um, and so this picture is a, uh, just from a workshop I attended on ginseng stewardship methods. We were talking about um, other commercially viable plants that grow near ginseng. So he's actually got a, a black, black cohosh root. Um, and with that, I will leave it there. That gives us a good 10-ish minutes or so for questions. Um, but I hope that this today offered at least some clarity as to what I do as an anthropologist and how I think about my work. Um, and I also hope that it sparked, for some of you at least, um, some ideas about how what how me as a social scientist might be able to offer some insights for your projects. Um, basically, I am very open and excited about collaboration, if any of you are interested. Um, and so as we turn to the Q&A, um, enjoy this picture of my favorite trail at New River Gorge National Park in West Virginia.